Hello and welcome to video 2 for week 9. In this video I'm going to define a thing called a dihedral group. What is that? Well, it's a group of symmetries of polygons. So by polygons I'm referring to regular polygons with n edges and vertices. So starting with the equilateral triangle, the square, the pentagon, so forth and so on. If I think of these as embedded in R2, so there's your equilateral triangle, then I can think of matrix transformations, linear transformations, as potential symmetries of this. So I can ask what transformations, what rotations, reflections, dilations of the plane will preserve this. And I'm going to gather all those together and call them a uh, group dn. And I'm going to call this a dihedral group. This n will stand for the number of edges or the number of vertices. So d3 is the symmetries of the triangle, d4 is the symmetries of the square, d5 is the symmetries of the pentagon, so forth and so on. Um, some sources will call this d2n uh, for reasons which we'll see shortly. It's not, ne not necessarily consistent notation here, but I prefer for this course to refer to them as just by the number of vertices. I use the term group here, and I've used the term in previous videos when I talked about the general linear group, the special linear group, the orthogonal group. What do I mean by that? Well, a group is a set G that has some operation on it, which typically we call the multiplication. It doesn't have to be, strictly speaking, a multiplication. It could be an addition. It could be a composition. It could be something like matrix multiplication. But there's some operation. And that operation has an identity element. And that identity element is something that if we do the multiplication, which I'll just write, as writing elements next to each other. With the identity element, it doesn't do anything. So I think adding zero doesn't do anything in addition. Multiplying by one doesn't do anything for multiplication. Matrix multiplication by the identity doesn't do anything. Those are all identity elements. So a group has an identity, and everything in the group has an inverse. And an inverse is something that you multiply by to get back to the identity. And that's the formal definition of a group. It's got a multiplication, it's got an identity, and it's got inverses. And you already, in fact, know quite a few of these things. The integers are a group under addition, the identity is zero, and the inverse of anything is the negative of it. The natural numbers don't satisfy here because the natural numbers don't have the negatives. Three doesn't have an inverse for addition in the natural numbers because you need negative three to have three plus negative three to get back to zero. The rational numbers without zero are a group under multiplication, the identity for multiplication is 1, and the inverse is the reciprocal. If you multiply by a reciprocal, you get back to 1. We have to exclude 0, so this is the rational numbers without 0, because we can't divide by 0. Same for the real numbers. The real numbers without 0 are a group under multiplication. And then we've already defined these matrix groups, and I use the term group there because these are in fact groups according to that technical definition. The general linear group, all matrices that are invertible, so invertible means they have their inverses, the identity is the identity matrix, then the special orthogonal and special orthogonal groups also are groups by this formal definition. The identity is in all of them, and the inverses stay. If I have an orthogonal matrix, its inverse is also orthogonal, so it shows up in the group. But let me go back to dihedral groups, and in the rest of this video, I'm going to talk about the group D4 as an example of what it means to look at a group and look at its structure. So I'm combining two of the major themes of this course here. We're talking about symmetry. Here's a shape. We want to preserve it. We have symmetries for it. We're also talking about sets with structure. So D4 is going to be a set. It has some elements. And I want to investigate what's that structure like? What's this new multiplication of transformations in the group D4? What kind of structure do I get? So in D4, I'm going to identify eight elements. I'm going to have the identity, which is the transformation that doesn't do anything. I'm going to have three rotations. I can rotate by a quarter turn, I can rotate by a half turn, and I can rotate by three quarters of a turn. And each of those rotations is going to take this square with vertices 1, 2, 3, and 4 and return it to the same square. The vertices will be moved, but it's going to be the same square in the same spot. It's going to trace out the same shape. So this square is preserved under those rotations. I also have four lines of reflection, which I've labeled F1, F2, F3, and F4. So if I reflect over the x-axis, that's going to flip the square vertically, and that's going to preserve it. The square is going to stay where it is. If I reflect over the y-axis, same th thing is going to happen. 
If I reflect over this diagonal line, again, this sort of diagonal flip of the square is going to preserve it, and likewise this diagonal line. And I'm going to label these F1, F2, F3, F4 going counterclockwise like the rotations. So there are four lines of reflection, and that gives me the entire group, eight elements. The identity, three rotations, and four reflections, and the multiplication, so to speak, of the group is the composition of those transformations. So I have eight elements, I have a multiplication. I want to understand the structure. One of the ways I can do that is by essentially drawing a multiplication table. So I can draw the elements of the group, elements of the group here, and in all the places on this table, I can do the multiplication of this element and this element, very much like we did with multiplication tables for numbers in elementary school. In elementary school, we were trying to understand the structure of the basic number sets. And one of the ways we did that was multiplication tables. They told us what that structure was like. Here, I have a new structure. I have a new multiplication. I want to see what it's like. Let me go back to those basics. Let me try and develop a multiplication table. So for the rest of this video, I'm going to try and end with a multiplication table for the group D4 as a demonstration of its structure. All right, that's all well and good. How do I actually calculate this? So I could express everything as matrices and do the matrix multiplication, but there's a nicer way to do the calculations for dihedral groups, and that's the thing I call vertex operations. So I want to tell you how that works so that you can do some of these calculations yourself as well in the activities and the assignment. So if I have my square, one, two, three, four, if I know where the vertices go, then I know everything. Because as soon as I know where the vertex 1 and 2 goes, the line between them has to stay as the line between their two outputs. Because the transformation is linear, it preserves lines. And if I knew to know two points, I know a line. So as soon as I know where the vertices go, I know everything about the transformation. So what does R1 do? R1 is a rotation by a quarter turn counterclockwise. So that's 1 going to 2, 2 going to 3, 3 going to 4, and 4 going to 1. So I can write that as a set of transformations of the vertices, which vertices go to the space where which vertice originally inhabited. One goes to the space where two was, two goes to the space where three was, so forth and so on. I've also got a vertex operations for F2. One, two, three, four. F2 is reflection over this line. So I reflect over this line while one's on the line, it doesn't change. And likewise, three is on the line, it doesn't change but two and four get switched. So one stays at one, three stays at three, two goes to four, four goes to two. There's the vertex operation of F2. This is a nice succinct way of encoding these operations. I can use this to calculate composition. So let me do this and say, what happens if I do R1 composed F2? Remember composition, this happens first, this happens second. So let me think about what happens to my vertices under these two compositions. So one, if I first look at the reflection over this line, it stays where it is, so one goes to one, and then the rotation sends it to two. So all in told, one goes to two under these two, doing the right one first and the left one second, because we always work from right to left. Two gets flipped to four under the reflection and then gets rotated to one, so two goes to one. Three stays where it is under the reflection, that then gets rotated to four, so three goes to three goes to four. Four gets flipped over to two and then rotated to three, so all in told four goes to three. So I can do the composition by figuring out where the vertices go, and then I can say, well, what, what is this? One goes to two, two goes to one, three goes to four, four goes to three. Well, that's switching these two and switching these two. One goes to two, two goes back to one, three goes to four, four goes back to three. That's reflection over the y-axis, which is what I called F3. So in that sense, I can calculate this composition using these vertex operations. Now, matrix multiplication and composition of linear transformations is not commutative, so I need to calculate this, and I also need to calculate the other direction. So let me do the same thing with vertex operations, one, two, three, four. And now I do the reflection, the rotation first, and then the reflection. So one rotates to two, and then flips over to four, so one goes to four. Two, two rotates to three, and three is on the line of reflection, so it stays there. Three rotates to four, and then flips over to two. Four rotates to one, and then one is on the line of reflection, so it stays there. 
And then I can say, well, one goes to four, four goes to one. That's flipping these two. Three goes to two, two goes to three. That's flipping these two. That's reflection over the x-axis. That's what I called F1. So in this way, I can calculate that F2 composed R1 is F1. And this was different from what we did on the previous slide because these things are non-commutative, the order matters. So that's just two examples, but I could keep doing that and I could put together a whole multiplication table. So I have this composed this. So each element here is going to be, so this is gonna be F4, the row composed R2, the column, and done in that order. So we do R2 and then we do F4, and that's gonna give us the reflection F2. And we see a lot of interesting structure in this multiplication table. So there's nothing different from what I just did in the previous slides. I've just now done all 64 entries here as opposed to the two different ones I did before. Now, when you calculate these things, you often don't have to do all 64. You'll find patterns that you can use. And I want to sort of point these out. We've got some nice patterns. We've got some identities here. We've got some identities here. That reflects, that shows that, well, R1 and R3 do those, you do a quarter turn, then three quarters of a turn, you've done a full turn, the full turn is the identity. Here, you do F2 and then F2, you do reflection, then you undo it, that's the identity. In this quadrant, we see that if we do a reflection, then a rotation, or a rotation, then a reflection, we get a reflection. Here, we see that if we do a reflection, then a rotation, we get a reflection. Here, we see that if we do two reflections, we actually get a rotation. So these compositions, this one is F4 composed F2. It's a reflection, then a reflection, and it outputs a rotation. And there's a bunch of more structure you can see there. You can see sort of diagonal patterns of similar things here. You can see diagonal patterns of similar things here. You can see diagonal patterns of similar things here. So lots of interesting structure going on in this diagonal patterns here. Diagonal patterns of identities. And all of that is what we refer to as the structure of the group. And it's really nicely encoded, I sort of erase all my drawings now, in this multiplication table. Everything about the multiplication of the group is right here in the table. We know all the information. We know how to get identities. We know how to do, uh, we know how to do different kinds of transformations. We know the patterns that show up. This is what I'm referring to. And this, this is a pretty rich structure for just eight elements. It's a lot you can get out of just putting eight elements together and seeing what happens. And it's also very natural. This is the symmetries of the square. There's nothing we sort of had to awkwardly invent. It's a natural thing to ask, how can we move a square around so that it stays this in the same space? We can rotate it, we can reflect it. And how do you put those things together?